Mr. Richmond? Here. Ms. Sipsey? Here. Ms. Tash? Here. Dr. Zollett? Here. Ms. Lawling? Here. Mr. Bonnell? Here. Ms. Miller? <coughs> I do believe uh, that's Miss Stevie Allen. I like Stevie because I'm like, I know that name is Stevie mm -hmm. Nicks. So that's the only after. You guys don't know that. You're too young. I too know young. that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look. Young. I know, right? But, but um, oh, and, okay. and we'll wait um, to have the mayor um, speak a little more about you when we'll just go around the schedule so we can go on to the approval minutes and probably Jeff. This is a full um, financial report. Skin cancer, there, there's several types. I guess I won't start with that. So yeah. Skin cancer, most common type of uh, cancer in humans uh, in the United States. Greater than 90% of all skin cancers are caused by ultraviolet radiation. So sun exposure and, of course, much less extent than it used to be with tanning beds uh, still are a huge uh, influence on our total ultraviolet radiation exposure. Typically, they present as kind of non-healing wounds ulcerations, enlarging or changing molds, or sudden abrupt temp change in uh, skin coloration of the localized area. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer at some point in their life. So the three main types, uh, there are several types, but the three main ones that we'll talk about because of their preventability are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma, most common cause uh, type of skin cancer, <coughs> starts in the basal cells, which is the second layer of the skin uh, under the squamous cells. They are creating new skin cells that filter up to uh, create a protective barrier that is our skin. It grows very slowly, so it rarely metastasizes. Um, it is uh, common in sun exposed areas, so your head, neck, shoulders, upper torso are the most common places to find it. Um, it's most influenced by your exposure as a, as a youth. So as kids and young adults, the majority of your risk comes from the sun exposure you had during that time, particularly sunburns um, that, that come earlier in life. And, and as I said, its mortality is very low, 0.3%, because it is such a slow-growing cancer. You, you've got a lot of time to catch it and get it taken care of. Squamous cell carcinoma, the second most common type of skin cancer, it's the top layer of skin cells uh, on our skin. It again is sun exposed area because that's our big risk factor we're talking about. So it's again, it's head, neck, tips of the ears is a common place on the top of the ears, the tip of the nose as this person has here. Um, it's a cumulative lifetime of sun exposure. So it's the one that's unique from the other two that your risk doesn't really change as you're growing older, you still wanna be avoiding sun, keeping uh, out of the radiation exposure so that you don't continue to increase your risk for, for cancer. It usually begins as more of a nodular uh, lesion on the skin or an ulceration that just doesn't seem to heal. 
you know, oftentimes you get people into the office and they say, oh, I think I bumped my leg on this thing or my arm or something, and, I, and then you say, well, how long has it been there? Three months. Well, you know, that's not an injury that hasn't healed in three months. That's probably a squamous cell carcinoma. It's much more rapid growing than the basal cell carcinomas. It, it can metastasize, um, but you really kind of got to leave it alone for a while and ignore it uh, for it to get there, but it can compared to the basal cell. Melanoma, of course, is the one we, we all kind of fear much more. Fortunately, it's the least common of the three. Um, it, it starts with <coughs> the melanocytes, which create melanin <coughs> in the base of the skin, which melanin is what gives us the pigment to our skin. It had by far is the highest mortality of about 20% of all mel uh, melanomas lead to death, and it accounts for 75% of all skin cancer deaths. So melanoma is the one that really is um, <coughs> kind of the feared skin cancer. Oftentimes it starts as a mole you've had for years and years and years, as long as you can remember, and suddenly it starts changing. It's getting rapidly bigger, or gets that kind of irregular border you see there, or the pigmentation is non-uniform, as you see there. So you get parts that are darker and parts that are lighter, but it can pop up spontaneously as well. It doesn't need the underlying mole. Um, this one, again, is kind of like the basal cell. It's your early sun exposure, uh, younger in life, particularly if you have uh, sunburn that damage the skin, um, and again, the asymmetric shape and color variation. So risk factors for skin cancer, again, the number one thing is the ultraviolet radiation. Whether it's sun, whether it's tanning beds, being out in the middle of the day, um, is particularly the high intensity ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Um, higher altitude, you get more intense uh, radiation. History of sunburns. Again, that damage to the, to the skin uh, cells themselves puts you at more risk. Fair color uh, skin color is a risk factor. Age, tobacco, smoking is actually a risk for uh, skin cancer. And people who have chronic non-healing wounds for differing reasons, it actually puts them at increased risk for squamous cell cancer later on. And then if you have a family history. Prevention all comes down to limiting the exposure and the UV rays. Wearing sunscreen, wearing long sleeves, long pants, uh, hats, uh, sunglasses, staying out of that midday sun, doing things early in the morning or later in the evening, um, all impact that intensity of the UV exposure and quitting smoking. Diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis, of course, is getting a piece of it. Usually the lesions kind of contain, so they'll just do a, uh, either a full excision or a biopsy get the pathology, find out what it is, um, and then if they think there's any chance for metastases, imaging will follow up to see uh, is there any kind of uh, spread of the cancer. Treatment, almost always surgery, removal of the lesion, whether it's Mohs surgery where they do small layer by small layer by small layer until they make sure they get the entire cancer or a more invasive uh, removal of the entire thing at one uh, shot. If they're an older individual that maybe it's in a more difficult spot, they'll do radiation, still play highly effective if there hasn't been uh, distant metastases, and then chemotherapy. If you've got melanoma, it's spread, or, or even squamous cell, there are um, certainly more effective chemotherapies. There's also topical chemotherapy for uh, squamous cell and actin keratosis, which is precursor to it, um, that you can apply topically, kind of, you know, essentially burns off those skin, precancerous skin cells uh, before they turn into anything else. So treatment is extremely good. You've got, um, even with melanoma, you've got a 90% five-year survival rate um, because treatment has become uh, so much better. Distant metastases and melanoma, that's your problem. Melanoma is one of those cancers that most physicians um, kind of never like to say you've got, you're cured. It's You've always got that in your back of mind that melanoma can always kind of come back and haunt you um, with, with a recurrence. Um, but the survival rate is, is dramatically better than it used to be. That's my presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Any questions? So wear your sunscreen. <laughs> Often. And don't smoke. <laughs> Eat your veggies. <laughs> Eat your veggies from inside out. Your skin will be healthier. Um, okay, so the next order of business is new business. 
And it looks like we have no travel authorizations. No, we do not. But um, next month, it is our fall conference that uh, Carla and Dr. Genelai and I will be attending. So we'll bring those. The conference is at the end of the month, and so we'll bring those in September. So, And then Chandra may, or is that an all day or not an all day? Uh, you may next, have a travel request. The next one I have that would need a travel request maybe would be in November. November, so you're good. Where's the conference at that you are going to? Uh, always in Columbus. They have Dublin. Dublin, little cute, little small, quite walkable town. Wonderful. So, okay. Yes. So the next item would be the approval of agreement between Butler County General Health District and the City of Middletown Health Department. Uh, so this is for the uh, Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grant. Do you just call it FEP? Or we call it FEP grant. FEP and grant. this is the grant you guys have been seeing every year. Every year we approve it. It usually is... I think it usually expires like July 31st, but by the time everybody gets the contract, looks at it, we look at it, their department looks at it, but this is the county grant that all both uh, cities receive to do our public health emergency preparedness planning. And there are things in there called deliverables that we have to do to get the money so we get money back when we deliver things. And uh, Chandra right now is controlling or managing that grant. How many years have we received this grant? Oh, since 9-11. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a long time. Mm -hmm. And 9-11, all of that, this started happening with emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. Monies came down from the federal government, and it's multiple things. We talk about radiation. We talk about um, dispensing of drugs. And our pods usually, uh, we practice pods, and we just do those pods, meaning points of dispensing. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what you're dispensing and one big pod we did was the COVID vaccines. And so it just prepares you for emergencies that you do. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So it's about almost $24,000, so almost $2,000 a month. Yes. Has that uh, price No, is that a month? That's, that is usually. We, bill, we, we um, yeah. have billing on a quarterly basis, mm -hmm. and then it's, it's dependent on the deliverables. Each deliverable is weighted differently. So one quarter we may get. Two thousand dollars. Next quarter, we make it ten thousand dollars. Yeah, I it, noticed that. Yeah, it, it fluctuates based on the weight of the deliverables. I just in my mind, that's how I kind of think yeah. about it, like on average. Yeah. So that, but yes, that's correct. Um, okay. And I think it's, it looks like yeah, the total grant is about twenty five thousand. How do they? How do they determine? Yeah, it's twenty four something. It's like twenty two twenty eight. How do they determine how much money we receive or different places receive? Uh, it is based usually upon population, I do believe. In the state, they usually do it. And the um, state always likes to look at five regions it's instead of 88 counties and the cities or whatever. So they give it to different regions. Larger health departments like Hamilton County, they receive a lot more money, of course, than we do. Franklin County, those large ones. But I do believe it's on population and what's required of us to do. Sometimes those larger populations do the radiology things. They they have all those sensors. So we look to Cincinnati, Hamilton County, if we were going to do air quality and different things. If uh, for some reason, if they start doing, um, what do you call it? Like uh, nuclear. Yeah, nuclear stuff. And they have different sensors yeah. down there. So they would get the money for those large equipments, those large activities, and we lean to them to do that. But And then some of the money, Butler County gets a lot of the money because they are afforded epis, epidemiologists, mm -hmm. to watch all the disease reporting. So they give a flop of that money. But Butler County's epidemiologists are ours as well. When a county gets so large over a certain population, the state makes them have at least another additional epi. And so all of our epi work, meaning surveillance of diseases and whatever, comes through Lefty County. Is that why we don't monitor HIV, syphilis, and what's the other one? Yeah, HIV, HIV. yeah, and that's through, those are usually through eight different um, regions, and Hamilton County has our HIV syphilis grant. We used to have it going through Montgomery County that c covered Warren County, Middletown City, Hamilton City, but Hamilton County has the grant now for HIV, syphilis, and, tu and tuberculosis is every county. Did you say tuberculosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah one every county has a uh, tuberculosis, uh, they call it some control center. So that's always a responsibility of the county. County commissioners in the county, they get money for that. Okay. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? Nope. Okay, do we have a motion for that to approve? 
Okay, uh, do we have a motion to approve the agreement between Butler County General Health District and the City of Middletown Department Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grant? So moved. There's a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? I'm sorry. <laughs> Please call the roll. Thank you. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Richmond? Yes. Ms. Bidstein? Yes. Ms. Tash? Yes. Dr. Zoller? Yes. Ms. Lawley? Yes. Mr. Bonnell? Yes. Okay, thank you. The yeses have it. The motion passes. All right, so the next item, we have a total of four. The next item is the first reading of the MBHE ordinance number 202401 um, by title only food fees. Um, do we have a motion to approve the ordinance? So I'm moved. I'm sorry. Do you want to read it? You, a motion to read by title, title only, and then you just read. Oh, the I see. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then you, that's yeah. You just yeah. read the title only, not all. I usually yeah. It's not a full though. Yeah. Yeah. It's we're just. just first first reading. Oh, it's the first, first reading. reading. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then never mind. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do we have a motion to read the title only? So moved. And maybe we have a second. Second. Okay. Ms. McDonald, please call the roll. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Richmond? Yes. Ms. Sipsey? Yes. Ms. Tash? Yes. Dr. Zoller? Yes. Ms. Lawley? Yes. Mr. Bonnell? Yes. Okay. Is there any discussion then? At this time, since this is a first reading? Yes. Yes. First reading. Okay. So is there any discussions, any questions? Anybody has anything to say? And correct, correct me, Carl, if I'm wrong. When we read this by title only, this is the opportunity for anyone to have any discussion. It's the opportunity for our businesses, when they look at this, if they have any discussions regarding this. And it can be changed up until the time we vote. And so this is why we just kind of put those um, fees out in the atmosphere so they can see if they have any. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions or comments at this time? I was just curious, um, as far as the increases, it's between, I guess, with the several different ones here, about 15%, 11 to 15%. Um, why the increase at this time and at that amount? Um, well, basically, we're trying, the, the fees are based on the time spent in the program. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to cover our costs. We don't make any money out the program, so we're just trying to cover our costs that for us to do the inspection. Yeah, we talked about that a while ago, mm -hmm. how we don't really make money on these. We no. just cover the basics. Yeah. We could charge more, but we don't. Correct. We're pretty much at the maximum, okay. almost at the maximum, but not quite at the maximum. Okay. And, and these fees, Carla, they, we were trying to make up the difference from COVID, too, because we spent less time in the program, and although we're still responsible for the program, when you spend less time in it, the fees decrease. So you lose, you know, because it's based on the cost of your time spend in the program. So that we're getting back up to where we were before the pandemic. And how do we um, how do we communicate this with the business owners? I think we letters are sent out. We sent out letters uh, actually after the first reading. Letters will go out to the businesses and they will have a public hearing the next day and they notify them of the public hearing. Okay. And they get they have to give them a twenty day notice at least mm. with okay. the public hearing. Do businesses usually attend? Um, I we no, they may call and ask questions, some of them, but they can, but we have not had anyone here staying in a while. Okay. Steve Dillman, probably Steve Dillman. Yeah. Dillman. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, when we do have people call in, we will go ahead and during the public hearing, we'll ask, like, have there been any, has there been any communication? Oh, yeah. So you'll yeah. come and let us know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments at this time? Okay, hearing none, we shall move on to the next item and the last in new business, which is the first reading of the MBHE ordinance number 2024-02 by title only full fees. Uh, do we have a motion to read by title only the ordinance? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, great, thank you. Um, please call the roll, Ms. McDonald. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Richmond? Yes. Ms. Sipsey? Yes. Ms. Tash? Yes. Dr. Zoller? Yes. Ms. Lawley? Yes. Mr. Bonnell? Yes. Okay, thank you. And would you like to read the title just for everyone? Or do me? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the MBHE ordinance number 2024 um, 02 or 002 is a regulation establishing a schedule for implementing fees for the licensing of public swimming pools, public spas, and special use pools. Um, is there any discussion at this time about this ordinance? 
no action as it is a first reading. Again, mm -hmm. I'm assuming we'll have a public hearing at the next meeting as well. Correct. Okay, let me see if there's any, if I have any questions on that. Mm. So the pool owners are also notified in the same way? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay, that's it for me. Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, we shall move on. Okay, the next item of business on our agenda are reports. The first one begins with Health Commissioner. Okay, um, due to vacation and COVID, my report should be short. <laughs> um, excited, it is budget, but I'm excited. It is budget time. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, it, yeah, I know. It is budget time, so I, it looks like that it's going to be a simpler process. Um, we're on a new system, so Carla, Nancy, and I have been kind of looking and trying to figure out where we're putting items, but it uh, appears it's the same. I think the city manager, acting city manager, Nathan Cahill, Cahill said that he, um, has given us the budgets and we can discuss any fine-tuning of them, but they're pretty straightforward and basic and so a lot of the changes were made last year budget season, so it should be pretty easy and cent Central connection. I think they have selected we were doing interviews all last month and I think they've probably landed on a person and um, I don't want to mention it now because I don't know if it's actually presented and accepted and all that, but I think they have a manager. I think they're gonna start with a manager to start getting some of the event planning off, like renting the center for lunches, uh, businesses, trainings, weddings, showers, etc., and try to get that off and running, and then maybe possibly, hopefully, bring on some additional assistance with the senior activity part, but to be continued. So the city's going to run it? it uh, yes, it appears that they will. Mm -hmm. Right now, for now, yes, it will be a city employee and running of it. Like they run everything else, huh? Yes. Okay. So to be continued. And um, then we had a successful walk and talk. The mayor attended that. Um, Councilmember Carter. Yes, and Councilmember Carter. I was at home with COVID at that, on the the 20th, and I heard it was fun, yes. successful, very good. They are, the Walk and Talk is a program that, remember we're doing, um, that's a, like a national program. International. And international, yes, thank you. And it's a doctor that does a little spill at first and then you walk. And you're hoping you're bringing community people to the walk. Doctors are invited, doctors are invited to speak every month if they would so choose to on a snippet of a issue. And so the next one is scheduled August 17th is from 9 to 10. And was it from 9 to 10 pretty much? I think it's kind of, yes, because you, you walk at your own pace. You walk as far as you wish. But then what was so wonderful, it was a beautiful day, beautiful walk. You do it all year, so even in the snow, which is really nice, you get outside in the fresh mm -hmm. air. But at the end, we kind of all congregated. That's when all the little chats and the fun, the kids were there, and we're all just talking. It really is a nice way to build a relationship and to have community and be with people and make new friends. Yeah. Uh, and it started in Columbus, and it's now international. And, and the doctor said he was getting more from his clients and patients when he was outside with them, outside the office, finding out really what was going on versus inside the office. And so that's why they kind of encourage you to do it. But it's just a national. They have great little, if you sign on, great little uh, tips once a month with different things about getting out and how sitting on the couch is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes <coughs> and making it. Wow. So, yeah. So, Get up off the couch. So that will be, and I will send those reminders out to you. Uh, we also put in the packet the, uh, the Hispanic uh, Heritage Second Annual Festival. We will all be attending that. Carla and her um, staff will be with the booths. Um, Stephanie is bilingual, so she'll help us with the booths. Um, if anybody needs any communication or language, has any language barriers, Chandra will be down there tabling, will be a part of this, the community um, festivities, and this is the second annual, so to be continued. Can I mention that it's, um, yeah. definitely if you can go, please do join in. Last year was the first one, it was so much fun, the music was amazing, the people were so much fun, and the food was absolutely incredible. 
that's why I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> it was incredible. And get there early because yeah. the great food runs out. I mean, <laughs> I love tamales, and I got there and I had the corn tamales that was left over. But I like, I love the chicken tamales. And oh, the, yeah. Yummy. yeah, those only corn ones left. So. But yeah, if yeah, <laughs> and oh, and the the desserts, the pastries mm -hmm. and stuff are really good. So. Uh, so that's in, that's at the end of September. So we're going to give you a flyer every um, mm -hmm. meeting until then. Just nice. to spread it around, take it with yeah. you. We're doing letters. I, I did letters of support for a BI three grant. This is with Bethesda. It's a, a foundation where they give out money. And um, CBI applied. Uh, Butler County group applied for infant mortality they and they applied for nutrition cl classes and exercise. This is Bethesda Hospital? Okay. Yes, yeah, Bethesda Hospital, thank you. And so it, again, we're trying to work within our whole um, uh, community health improvement plan as far as being healthy, eating healthier, getting out in activity, so merging all the things we're doing throughout the community. So I will let you know if they get the grants. If they get the grants, we'll be a part of the nutrition classes, the exercise classes, and et cetera. We'll just start doing things and partnering with the community. And this is with kids, with pregnant women, with elderly, especially seniors. We're trying to really encourage seniors to get up, get moving, and um, keep moving. I think one of my seniors that had a stroke said, remember, motion is lotion. And so I like that little term. I said, I'm going to steal that from you because it really is important to keep moving, just to keep moving. So that is um, to be continued. I'll let, them know, I'll let you guys know if they get the grant. We had the first Butler County Health Conversation. If you guys remember me talking about bringing political figures to the table from all throughout the county, this was a Thomas Hall's suggestion when we were kind of meeting. Maybe we'll meet once a year and find out what's going on in the community, Butler County, as far as the health initiatives. So that when they're at the state level and city levels and making policies, they will know who to contact with information, statistics, as well as what actually needs to be done. Uh, we were talking about smoking, say for instance, and th this came up at the meeting, and you would appreciate this, Dr. Zollett. And they were like talking about, well, you know, that we really support businesses. And then we said, <laughs> we said, but if those businesses were selling things and hurting our community, would you support that? And we start talking about it. He understood that um, some businesses are not great businesses, right? Or some businesses need um, offset prevention measures. Like if we had a big casino comes, that might be, yay, taxes and everything. But are younger people getting involved in gambling? Are people, so you have to look at the, the harm that's done with some of the things. And so they recognize that when, and we brought out, most importantly, the housing problem in Butler County and suicide rates that are going up. Those are some of the two things that were, were mentioned. So the next one, um, it's about 30 people there. Mm -hmm. And um, we said the next time, hopefully, it'll just be one time a year, just bringing statistics and Butler County health initiatives. Mm -hmm. And um, all three health departments were there and some other agencies were there. Commissioner was there. Yes. And yeah, and Cindy Carpenter reps. was there. Yeah. State reps was there. So it was it was it was a good meeting. We hope it just uh, continues. Township people were there. Too, yeah, so. it was it was wonderful. If I may say, like mm -hmm. that was a really great way to meet people to have these conversations in particular, and and to like you said to be introduced to the people that we can reach out to mm -hmm. when we have questions. So I really got a lot out of that meeting, mm -hmm. and I, I'm looking forward to to more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll know about those. That was the first, and we were trying to see what it was going to look like. And we kind of said afterwards, too much talking, kind of from agencies more so. And, and so we were trying to give them a lot of information. We won't do that the next time. But it was an hour and a half. We kept it pretty tight. So, And I do believe that the last thing I want to say is that we are recognizing Central Pastry's anniversary. Aww. So 75 years in existence. Wow. but. The Slamka family has had it for 40? My parents. Plus? Yep. Yeah, 40, 40 years. 40 years. Of, it's nice it kind of coincided in this year. 75 years and 40 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, long time uh, businesses that you really appreciate. And I think Cullen Brothers just celebrated 100 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, Why that's. Like years? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We have some businesses that have been around since like the Civil War, like Denny's Lumber, mm -hmm. Divers, like it's. 2075. 
Look at that. What? Oh. Wow. Yeah. I wasn't there at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say that because I was going to say, uh, Ken and Neil Cohen are about 100 years old. So that was, uh, I mean, but they're in the, yeah, you know, you get, if I'm 16, so you can easily get there. So um, and I just really appreciate those longstanding businesses that stayed, supported Middletown. And so thanks. And Jeff, did they acknowledge um, your business? Who's they? Oh, the city. Anybody? No, see, because I mean, those are the kind of things that they usually like to do that. So we might get, is it 175 this year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can, if you would like, um, speak. We can talk after as well. Yeah. But if you'd like to have like a little celebration, um, Downtown Middletown Inc. or the city can do a little special ribbon cutting for you. They can write a proclamation for you. Just a little something to do to really mm -hmm. acknowledge that. Yeah. It's nice. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Because we appreciate that. So that's it. That's my report. Thank you. All right. Um, next would be our medical director. Okay, reportable illnesses. We had 24 chlamydia, only five gonorrhea, but we had two syphilis, two pertussis, one aseptic meningitis, one uh, sporadic legionella, three hepatitis B, six hepatitis C, three HIV, uh, two chlamydia or candida auris, and uh, two CPO. So <coughs> those kind of chronic. Um, antibiotic resistant infections continue to uh, kind of creep up in hospital and long-term care facilities. Hey doctor, do we have, um, has HIV been increasing steadily or just just now that spun up a bit? This month is kind of an outlier. Mm -hmm. We had, I think it was 2021, we had a pretty significant uh, increase uh, Butler County wide. Um, so there was a lot of effort put into why. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? The following year, it dropped back to kind of more typical rates. So there was something sporadic even in that year. But in a general sense, there seems to be no increase. Testing is sporadic too with the uh, needle exchange uh, facilities. There's, there's a lot more testing that's available easier. Um, but overall, numbers seem to be fairly steady and consistent. So Butler County don't have a. I'm just looking. This is way up. Couldn't it in the last uh, just last month or whatever? I mean, Butler County's numbers. Yeah, I mean, one was 200 percent, one's 170, 132. You know, I think I, you know. I have to be honest. I don't pay attention to Butler County as a whole. I look at just our numbers. But again, it's it's pretty sporadic on the numbers. The needle exchange um, facility moving also changes the dynamics of um, who's getting tested and where they're getting tested. And, how those numbers are coming in. So it's a lot to kind of track because it's sort of a moving target to a certain extent um, by by those dynamics of who's going to get tested and who is getting tested. Did, did we find, find out what it was in 2021 that no. we never did? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's oh, kind of amazing that the more sophisticated we're supposed to become, <laughs> you know, with everything, <laughs> that there, there was an article in the paper and also here that uh, people aren't getting vaccinated and they're getting all these different, you know, things that's, you know, that they wouldn't get if they were vaccinated and they're letting them in the schools and they're letting them everywhere else, you know, not having a full set of vaccinations. I, mean, I think, yeah, that will... The longer you go on, I mean, you're supposed to be more sophisticated and be able to have less of this and you're getting more. I think... Um, you know, there was a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy that was rising before COVID. And I think the COVID vaccine situation, however it was handled, um, has certainly amplified that uh, hesitancy and uh, the percentage of people who are being much more cautious about vaccines has definitely increased. But, you know, I think as most of us saw a recent, um, oh shoot, I'm blanking on what it was earlier this summer. Measles. Measles, Measles outbreak, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those, again, are pretty sporadic. It seems like every couple of years you get a decent uh, bump in measles numbers throughout the country. Um, and it usually kind of hits the unvaccinated population. Um, you know, most of those childhood vaccines have at least a 95% success rate. Me, 
Um, but so you do get people who get vaccinated but still don't have good immunity, but there are few and far between. So most of those cases are the unvaccinated. And as long as your kids are vaccinated against childhood illnesses, there are a lot of vaccines out there that um, shingles and even chicken pox that aren't as life threatening as some of the earlier ones. And the, my concern always is there's getting such a number of vaccines and all this hesitancy oh, in vaccine wow. that we're missing the really important ones because people are just saying no to them all. Mm -hmm. And we're missing those really important ones, the MMRs and those, because we've kind of overwhelmed the system with so many vaccines now, but um, it's, it's only gonna get tougher <laughs> on vaccine rates, there's no doubt. Hi, uh, if I may add, my name's mm -hmm. Phoebe, I'm a local nurse and I'm a, a triage nurse. I worked COVID ICU um, throughout the pandemic and so, um, you know, they're raised a question a lot of why are folks uh, declining to get the COVID vaccine and, you know, what drives them to um, deny what we know scientifically would be better for them. Uh, and uh, what I found is folks, uh, we have to meet them at their level of reasoning. And I think we, I really examined, you know, where are you getting your information from? And, you know, what makes you feel more comfortable taking advice from your neighbor uh, who does not work in healthcare? Uh, versus, you know, your doctor or the local health department, the local authorities on uh, what would be safer for you. Um, and so I feel like when folks have a better working relationship with someone in healthcare, um, even like on a personal level, they're more willing and more open to the information that's provided to them. So I think um, it's like the walk with the doc uh, program, things like that, that connect with the community on a personal basis, once they have that personal connection with somebody in the community that they trust that is in healthcare and is able to give them accurate advice as far as medical decisions, I think they make better choices. And I think there's opportunity there to meet the community at that education level and, and provide that relationship that makes them trust the advice that they're getting. Because they can hear all day long that you need to vaccinate your children, but you know, uh, a place where they have a sense of community and even a group on Facebook that says vaccines are bad, uh, you know, makes them feel safe and meets them at their level of reasoning there uh, versus the personal relationship they might have. So I've heard folks even say to me, you know, well, you know, my sister's a nurse and she says I should get the vaccine, so I got the vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's that level of trust. And I think there definitely is a breakdown of trust um, mm -hmm. as far as like healthcare advice goes, especially through the pandemic, folks were very upset about circumstances and you know how the pandemic was handled so I think yeah. in the future there's definitely opportunity to build and you we can't be remiss to recognize that when you don't see these diseases it becomes less threatening and then when you see them then people because we've done a good job at eradicating a lot of the childhood diseases and so when you don't see polio and you don't see measles yeah and mumps and then people think, well, you know, it's just they don't exist, and we're way out of it. You know, we used to have to educate new doctors of what those things look like, and syphilis, what it looks like, and herpes, and what it looks like, because they had not <laughs> seen any of these, because most doctors have not been around when you were seeing a lot of those cases. And so I think it just, it's, it's one of those things that ebbs and flows, you know, when you get. Doctor, anything else for you Well, Jack and I have talked a lot about particularly the, the higher levels of public health that, again, COVID, I feel like, was a, a, a perfect example of a, a failure in communication. I mean, when you have a public health entity, for, for years we've talked about every time, whether it's the swine flu or bird flu or, you know, this was going to be the next massive epidemic and would kind of almost get to a scare point of people, um, it, people start to tune that out. And then COVID came on, which, which was a much more substantial outbreak. And then you have those in public health, again, higher levels than, than local community, but who, who are telling us that, you know, this vaccine is perfect. No side effects, 100% effective, we'll stop you from getting it, we'll stop this, stop that, blah, blah, blah. And, and then you find out that none of that was true. Um, and, and so I think that openness and, and transparency is key that, that was a major failure in COVID. And then that's led to these other things because then that opens the door to the other theories mm -hmm. that once you have bad information from the people you're supposed to trust, mm -hmm. well then I'm gonna listen to these people over here who don't seem any worse off than the people I can't trust because they told me all this other false thing. 
So it, it really was a failure of um, state and federal level public health through COVID. As much as they were trying to do the right thing, um, there, there were some very poor decisions made that um, are, are probably going to lead to a decade of difficulties for public health. But on the flip side of that, the positive side of that, CB, is the relationships that you built. Because in the community, smaller communities, we said that the whole time. <laughs> we'll tell you what we know. Yeah. Right now, this yeah. says local, this. Local levels, is local levels will vary. vary. Yeah. And, because and they are more, this is right. what we know. This is yeah. <clears throat> what our community and, needs to do. Absolutely. And they and they we maintain the trust. Even though it may have said, oh, I can, after a while, they can say, well, wait until the fall to do it. We maintain the trust. What are you going to do? Well, you know, this is that. Well, you know, and and uh, I think that was because they went to trusted individuals, and that's what you go back to on the larger scale. But on the small one, what would you do? What are you doing? What are you doing with your family? And so, thank yeah. you, Dr. Jenwell, for saying that too, because mm -hmm. I think it just goes back to the point, like in life, whether mm -hmm. it's like the state level, federal level, with each other. Just if you present the the information as we have it. Mm -hmm. We can trust others to make their best choice, and that's probably the best way to go, no matter what, right. that transparency part. Absolutely. So we can take that into our Absolutely. own health department, which we already have, and, and, and in our lives as well. Okay, is there anything else for your report? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And now for our Director of Nursing. Okay. Um, so since COVID was brought up, our COVID numbers are up um, this month. It's been steadily creeping up through the summer, which is a little bit of an anomaly because normally summer months, they're, it kind of dips because everybody's outside living their best life. Well, people are still living their best life. They're just also getting COVID, um, not getting the hospitalization rates, so, though, um, death rates, things like that, but they're still getting sick. Um, we do still offer free COVID tests here at the office, so um, those are available. They're on our front door, so people don't even have to come to the window. They can just pick them up. Um, Jackie already mentioned um, one of our outreach opportunities with the um, the Heritage Festival. Um, I'll be there um, handing out lead information and preparedness information um, because you know what better you know leading into the winter months to you know make people aware that you know winter storms things like that make sure that they're prepared um, and. Uh, Jackie also mentioned about our, you know, earlier with our FEP grant. Um, one of our big exercises, you guys aren't going to be required to participate in it or anything, but um, we are doing a chemical um, tabletop exercise for the region is one of our FEP um, deliverables this year. I think it'll be done in, uh, by spring. Um, but it's, it is basically how would each of the 13 counties in our region respond um, if there were a chemical spill um, in our area. Um, we've done it on a scale of where it happened in one location and the entire region interacts based off of it. This one may be kind of a artificiality where each of the 13 regions will have a spill in their own area. And how would you, inter you, know, how would you deal with that in your specific area? Um, and then kind of report it as a whole to the state. So more to come on that, on how that turns out, but that's our, that's our big exercise for the year. And when is that, when did you say that came out? And it's, it's, I believe it's due, um, the finalized um, after action report, I believe is due by like the end of March, but we haven't set a date for it. We just had a meeting yesterday in Columbus um, talking about our training and preparedness planning for the year. And is that when like the fire department would get involved with the hazmat unit? Yeah, they would be partners. Um, yeah, EMA, hospitals, mm -hmm. um, all of our you know you know our um, what we call access and functional needs partners. So schools, hospitals, um, daycares, DD, um, any you know senior um, community partners, things like that. We would pull in because messaging is and communication is key during any of that. So it, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, and a lot of partners to try to pull to the table on the day of. Thank you, I'll be looking forward to that, especially yeah. the messaging part, because in this day and age it is so difficult to get the messaging out, so I'm yeah. very interested in that, that part as well. Yeah. All right, anything else? I think I covered it. All right, any questions for Chandra? No? Nope. All right, and the last report today, Environmental Health Director. Oh. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Nicole Pennington, who's in the back. 
Nicole um, started with us um, August 1st as our um, registered environmental health specialist. Um, Nicole has a lot of, uh, she has a vast amount of knowledge and experience and she came from Preble County and she also worked in Butler County. So we are glad to have Nicole with us. Thank Welcome you. Nicole. Thank you. So. Would you like to say anything? I'll put you on the spot for a moment. Just want to say hi or anything like that? I'm just very happy to be here. Nice mm -hmm. to meet you all. Thank you. Um, so for the month of July, uh, we actually received three sets of plans. Um, we reviewed uh, six, um, an approved six, um, and we have one expedited uh, plan review. Um, we issued two licenses uh, this month, two food service licenses. We currently now have 70 um, tobacco facilities. Um, we have two, all of them are licensed, with the exception of, of two. Um, and we're waiting on some documentation for that. Um, Olivia has completed um, the compliance check on most of those. We have 43 um, that are not, that were not in compliance um, at the time of the inspection. Um, I think that's just edu education. Um, we're looking at signage and making sure that they have their license posted. So through education, I, I think we should be they'll be better. Um, we have to do the re-inspection, although they complied before she left, we'll do the, the uh, re-inspection within three months. Um, we have, last month, um, I mentioned that we had five new official orders for septic connections. Um, actually, out of five of those, two of those were already hooked up to sewer, but they weren't paying a sewer bill. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to rescind the orders for those. So now we have a total of five. Three of those are on Leveson Road, which were already issued. Um, one, there was a new owner, so we re 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 reissued an order for that one. We have one property on Union, which is a vacant property. We still issue orders just in case it's ever reoccupied. And we have one on Cincinnati Dayton. Um, last but not least, we have our state surveys uh, coming in. ODA, Ohio Department of Agriculture, is coming September the 9th through the 10th and the Ohio Department of um, Health, they rescheduled. So they will be coming uh, the end of September through the 1st of August. So they're usually here for about two or three days to survey our program. And that's it, I think, Nicole. Vicki, so we have two new food service licenses? Yes. Do you know the, which ones they that are? Was, well, it was Creekview, mm -hmm. which is Head Start is going into Creekview. Um, to in a couple of classrooms at Creekview. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was Miss Jade's mobile. Oh, all right. Yep. Very well. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Any questions or comments? All right. Here now we shall move on to um, the board member open discussion. So at this point, um, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. I, I looked and it said that all your money, for, or almost all your money for the indigent is gone. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, what do you do? After just the act, money's gone. Uh, they, uh, they appropriate more money back into the fund. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that money is not, um, uh, I think we, I think Amanda, I think we may have gotten another one. We were, we're down to the last two, I think. And I think we have another one, so we have one more before the money. And I already um, told the city manager okay. that, um, I'm curious. Yeah, that it is um, almost depleted, and he said he'll take care of it. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions or comments about anything? So I want to introduce uh, officially, yes. and mm -hmm. um, also before that, I wanted to say that um, just an update for mentioning um, the Butler County Homelessness Initiative. Um, I don't know if you saw in the paper there was a meeting. Did we have it in our packet? I'm not. I'm not sure if we did. Um, there was a meeting in Butler County at the county seat with the commissioners to talk about all the jurisdictions in the county. Right. One representative from each jurisdiction. Um, and to talk about the issues that the jurisdictions face um, because of homelessness, the challenges as well. And then also, 
um, ideas for how we can unify as a county to face this issue together. Um, and it was a very positive meeting. Um, people really wanting to come together as a county to support each other in different ways that we can. So that's a topic that I'm interested in as far as especially as far as health goes. Um, I think we, if you guys have ideas, um, there's a meeting every month that Jackie sometimes, I'm um, sorry, the health commissioner sometimes attends and I, I attend as well. Um, so if you have any ideas about that or like to speak, I'm, I'm open to hearing your ideas and especially as far as unifying as a county to address the issue. Um, that said, I would like to take this moment to introduce C.B. Allen. Um, she has agreed to come here today at 7.30 in the morning, which is so wonderful. Um, she is, like, would you take a moment to introduce yourself yeah. and why we're interested? Yeah, uh, I'm a nurse, uh, a triage nurse after hours um, right now. I work from home. Um, and I work within many specialties, including primary care, OBGYN, uh, pediatrics. I will admit, though, pediatrics makes up the majority of my calls along with OBGYN. Um, and uh, I also am a board member of the Hamilton Central YMCA. I am chair of project development. I do a lot of work with the uh, youth groups that we um, run, so things like after school programs, and um, we just recently did a playground program where we encouraged folks to participate more at city parks um, within Hamilton, though Middletown is my passion. This is my hometown. Uh, my dad's a third generation steel worker, and I, I grew up here, and I, I plan to return, but. I wanted to bring some of the things that I do um, as far as like primary violence prevention. Um, I'd like to expand on it and then also hopefully um, bring some of the things that might work here as well if it would benefit the city. Um, and this is how I ended up here today. <laughs> I was talking with Mayor Slam because sometimes our, our causes here align, um, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, social emotional learning was a big one and that's what I'll be working on through our after school to help with um, the primary violence prevention um, early in life, give them a better start, and that way we're not getting things from the back end and putting a Band-Aid on an arterial bleed of social issues, and if we can, can improve that earlier on. So my role here is to kind of learn what we're doing now and, and see how we can help. Yes, I'm, I'm thrilled with having met CB. Actually, I was at um, an event, and her father ran up to me. <laughs> like, wait, 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 and I, I want my daughter to talk to you, and, and I'm thrilled that he did that because she is definitely an asset. She will be coming back to Middletown soon-ish, and I just can't wait to see uh, how that's her, and her participation will be increasing. Um, she's already involved, <laughs> so it's wonderful. In fact, she will be attending, I think there's this handout I think you might have um, about the peace literacy skills for building strong communities. Well, as you know, uh, a few months back, uh, Middletown was having a um, conversation on violence in Middletown, um, and that's that's actual like physical violence. But this conversation is also like, what can we do to mitigate this kind of thing? To educate, to help people have ways to express themselves in a healthy fashion, um, and give them the vocabulary and the frameworks that they need. So this gentleman, um, Paul K. Chappelle, he is um, going to be coming via Zoom. He is his mother's full-time caretaker in Oregon, so he cannot be leaving for more than like one or two hours. So he will be visiting via Zoom. Um, and we are having this meeting tonight for organizations that work with populations like schools, like the YMCA, like the, the police, um, nonprofits, to see if they would like to use these structures and frameworks to teach their staff or to teach it forward to their populations. Um, he is a West Point grad, it says here, he is an Iraq War veteran, he served twice in Iraq, he retired as a captain, he went to work for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and he also, at the same time, was writing his six books, um, creating curriculum, free curriculum for grades K through 12 and then beyond as adult, to learn these um, skills. And he's just a fascinating human being, I first met him in 2015 when he came here for MidFest, and he was just speaking then. Mm -hmm. Um, but a great human, and um, this is, like I said, it's for organizations. If you feel like your organization would benefit from this, you're very welcome to attend tonight from 5.30 to 7.30 in council chambers, and also spread the word. And if you'd like an official like uh, invitation email to you, you can just ask me, and I'll email that to you, because it has some links about him. Um, he has something called the Fork Story that I think is very, it's entertaining, but it's also very powerful when he talks about disrespect and how things escalate very quickly and can get violent, whether it's verbally or physically. Um, so anyway, that's also going to on tonight. So thank you for sharing that in the mm -hmm. packet. Um, all right, is there anything else or any questions at this point? All right, hearing none, we can go ahead and adjourn.
Um, the next Board of Health meeting is scheduled for September 10th at 7.30 a.m. All right, thank you.